Welcome to The Power of Innovation, Inventors of the Industrial Revolution, an online U.S. history tutorial for high school students. By the end of this tutorial, you should be able to identify some of the key inventors of the Industrial Revolution, describe their inventions, and explain their significance. Most of the inventors you'll learn about in this tutorial come from the Second Industrial Revolution, often called the Technological Revolution. During this era, American inventors created a host of new devices across a range of industries that increased efficiency and production, helped grow the economy, enhanced safety, furthered communication, and made the day-to-day -day lives of Americans a little easier. Since most of the inventors you'll learn about in this tutorial come from the Second Industrial Revolution, let's start with a little review of this time period. The Second Industrial Revolution is typically dated from about 1870 to 1914, ending with the start of World War I. This era saw the widespread use of the internal combustion engine and machinery in manufacturing. Inventors and business owners developed more efficient, labor-saving machinery and mass production techniques, including use of the assembly line. America also became a manufacturing powerhouse. In 1894, the United States displaced Britain as the world's leading manufacturer. By 1914, it was the world's leading producer of coal, natural gas, oil, copper, iron ore, and silver. Its factories were producing more goods than Britain, Germany, and France combined. With the increase in steel production during this era, railway networks began to crisscross the nation, eventually connecting the east and west coasts. New entities called corporations were also developed. Many businesses grew into large firms that controlled all aspects of production and distribution, and others grew by mergers, joining forces with their competitors to dominate industries. Countless inventions were also produced to make the everyday lives of Americans easier. Sewing machines, typewriters, the fountain pen, the first modern air conditioner, safety pins and paper clips, adding machines, cash registers, and the escalator, to name just a few. In the decades leading up to the Second Industrial Revolution, communication across long distances became easier with the introduction of the telegraph. This device transmitted electrical signals over a wire laid between telegraph stations. Samuel Morse developed a code, now known as Morse code, that assigned a set of dots and dashes to each letter of the alphabet. This allowed complex messages to be relayed simply and easily across telegraph lines. In 1844, Morse sent his first telegraph message stating that everything worked well. In his first public demonstration, sending a message from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland, Morse relayed the now famous message, What hath God wrought? The telegraph astonished the world, as news could now be conveyed instantaneously hundreds of miles away. Within four years of this demonstration, America had 5,000 miles of telegraph wire. To learn One of the most significant inventions of the Second Industrial Revolution, one that forever changed how people communicated, was the creation of the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell. Bell, a teacher at a school for the deaf, devoted much of his spare time to conducting scientific experiments. He was greatly interested in creating a way to transmit multiple telegraph messages at once over a single telegraph wire. He also wanted to find a way to transmit the human voice by electricity. In 1876, Bell was 28 years old and his assistant, Thomas Watson, just 21 years old when they achieved a breakthrough in their experiments and successfully made the first telephone call. The first spoken words came from Bell. Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. To go about securing a patent for his invention, Bell employed the firm of Crosby and Gould, who were patent attorneys in Boston. A patent is the exclusive right granted by a government to an inventor to manufacture, use, or sell an invention for a specific period of time. Crosby and Gould selected their chief draftsman for this task, Lewis Howard Latimer. Latimer, a Navy veteran who served during the Civil War, began as an office clerk in the patent law firm. Interested in mechanical drawing, necessary for patent applications, in his spare time he taught himself through library textbooks to become a skilled draftsman. A decade later, Latimer was commissioned to create the drawings and all the documents Bell would need to secure a patent for his telephone, which was granted just days before Bell's first successful telephone call. 
when Bell offered to sell the patent or rights to the telephone to Western Union Telegraph Company, it turned him down. Western Union called the telephone an interesting novelty, but saw no commercial possibility or future for an electrical toy. Despite Western Union's lack of vision, the telephone quickly became one of the most successful modern inventions. In addition, the Bell Telephone Company, later renamed American Telephone and Telegraph, or AT&T, would become one of the largest corporations in America. Bell's investors would become millionaires. In the 20 years that followed Bell's invention, Americans would have over 6 million telephones. Bell, however, refused to install a telephone in his own study, fearing it would distract him from his scientific work. Other important innovations in communication during the Second Industrial Revolution were the product of Granville T. Woods. Woods was a busy inventor who secured more than 50 patents by the time of his death, mostly for electrical devices. One of his earliest and most successful inventions was an improved telephone transmitter that dealt with sound transmission. His invention came 10 years after Bell's creation of the telephone, but Wood's device surpassed all models in use because it carried a louder and more distinct sound over a longer distance. His invention would improve long-distance communication via telephone, and aspects of his device are still used in modern telephones. Another important invention that improved communication was Woods's creation of a mechanism called a telegraphony. It was a device that combined the telegraph and the telephone. Prior to his invention, the telegraph could only send messages over an electric current utilizing Morse code, which meant that operators on either end of the telegraphic message had to be fully versed in Morse code to send the message at one end and translate the message at the other. Wood's invention allowed messages to send in the traditional way, as electrical signals using Morse code, or now by voice. With his device, anyone could easily send a message by telegraph. If a person was unfamiliar with Morse code, he could simply flip a switch on the telegraph and speak the message near the sending key. The message would then be heard on the receiving end as speech. There was quickly a huge demand for his invention, and he sold his patent to the Bell Telephone Company. The money he received from selling the patent allowed him to become a full-time inventor. In addition to improvements in communication, great innovative strides were also made in the area of electricity. Leading these efforts was Thomas Edison. In 1879, Edison invented what would become the first mass-producible incandescent light bulb. An incandescent light bulb is an electric light with a filament heated to a high temperature by passing an electric current through it, eventually making the filament glow with visible light. Many inventors prior to Edison had attempted but failed to create a light bulb that would last long enough to be commercially successful. Edison's light bulb in 1879 burned for over 13 hours, but with continued experiments, he soon found a filament that allowed one light bulb to last over a thousand hours. Rival competitors were determined to improve upon Edison's work. Louis Latimer, who helped acquire the patent for Bell's telephone, joined the Electric Lighting Company of Hiram Maxim in 1879. Through his studies of electricity and lighting, he was awarded a patent in 1882 for an improved version of Edison's light bulb. Latimer went on to work for a number of different companies, including one that was incorporated by Edison. Later in life, when Edison's company and one of his rivals merged to form General Electric, Latimer helped GE become one of the most successful manufacturers of electrical parts and appliances. Edison used his business interests to capitalize on the success of his light bulb. His invention was amazing, but wouldn't be much use to people without a way to deliver electricity directly to their homes. He predicted that he could make electric light so cheap it would soon become universal. Edison and his team had to design and build the entire electrical distribution system to provide power for lighting, from designing and building the power stations to cheap and reliable wiring to distribute electricity and even the lamp stands and switches. The first central power plant in the United States, Pearl Street Station, was located in Manhattan and built by Edison's company in 1882. To supply his customers with electricity, Edison used what is called direct current, or DC. Direct current travels in only one direction. The main drawback with distributing electricity through direct current was a short transmission range, which meant that customers had to live within a mile of the electrical plant in order to receive electricity. It was also not effective for transmitting high voltages of electricity. 
Even with these limitations, Edison's direct current system began to be sold to cities throughout the U.S. To cover greater distances that could also handle higher voltage, alternating current or AC was required. With AC, the electric charge periodically reverses direction and is transmitted to customers by a transformer. The first commercial AC power system in the U.S. was developed by George Westinghouse in 1886. Edison, who wanted to protect his investment in the DC system, also believed alternating current, particularly because of its use of high voltage, was too dangerous. Even though New York City did not require it, Edison buried his DC power lines in the ground while AC was distributed overhead via power lines strung across poles. A number of deaths in New York City and in other places across the U.S. had resulted from the pole-mounted high-voltage AC power lines. Edison embarked upon a media campaign in hopes of directing public opinion against the use of AC systems. Soon, what became known as the War of the Currents ensued. To demonstrate the killing power of AC, Edison and others participated in public demonstrations to electrocute animals with alternating current. When the state of New York brought about the electric chair as an alternative to hanging inmates slated for death, Edison recommended the use of alternating current powered by a Westinghouse generator. In 1889, William Kemmler was put to death in an AC-powered electric chair. The electrocution was a ghastly affair that did not go well, and it helped neither side in the current war. In 1888, Westinghouse licensed the patents to an AC electric motor and transformer created by inventor and engineer Nikola Tesla, once an employee of Edison's who left after a bitter pay dispute. Westinghouse also hired Tesla for a time, giving him his own lab. Tesla soon found himself on the AC side of the War of the Currents. Tesla's patents helped Westinghouse to perfect the AC distribution system. Eventually, Edison lost the War of the Currents, and AC became the standard form to distribute electricity to homes and businesses. However, DC wasn't gone forever. Even today, battery-powered devices use DC, and fuel and solar cells produce DC power. In sum, creation, competition, and a war of the currents marked the early years of electricity in America, and through the pioneering work of Edison and his contemporaries, they forever changed the way Americans lived after dark. In addition to Edison's work in the field of electricity, other inventions by Edison still impact us today. In 1877, Edison created the phonograph. It was the first device that could reproduce recorded sound. The phonograph was a machine that used two needles, one for recording and one for playback. The user could speak into a mouthpiece and the sound vibrations were etched or engraved by one of the needles into a rotating cylinder, often called a record. To recreate the sound, the cylinder was rotated as the other needle, called a stylus, traced the grooves in the record to play back the sound. Edison's first recorded words were, Mary had a little lamb. Edison dreamed of a number of future uses for his phonograph, for letter writing and dictation, to record audiobooks for the blind, to reproduce music, to record family members' voices and stories for future generations, to connect with the telephone to record conversations, and for educational use to record teachers' lessons for students to play back at home. After creating the phonograph, Edison moved on to his work in electricity. However, ten years later he returned to focus on making improvements to the phonograph to create a commercial product for business and home use. Edison even created a special model of the phonograph for the U.S. Army. Army units purchased the phonographs to be used by American soldiers serving overseas during World War I. Edison's work also led to the beginnings of the commercial record industry, and Edison Records became one of the earliest record labels that pioneered sound recording and reproduction. Edison also had the idea to link the phonograph with the device that strung together a series of photographs to make the images appear as if they were moving. Edison and his team began by creating a motion picture camera, which they called a kinetograph. It used strips of long, flexible film that had been invented for a regular camera. It could be wrapped around a spool and took pictures so fast they seemed to move. Edison and his team also built a kinetoscope, a machine that could play the silent films, which lasted 20 to 30 seconds. One person at a time could view the movie through the peephole viewer at the top of the cabinet. Edison went on to invent a kinetophone, where the user watched images projected by a kinetoscope and used earphones to listen to a recorded sound played by a phonograph. 
Edison also went on to develop a projector called a projecting kinetoscope that allowed a film to be projected for a large audience, even marketing it for home use. In 1913, he introduced a new kinetophone that was connected to a projecting kinetoscope, which made an attempt to synchronize images and sound. So the next time you listen to music or watch a movie, remember Edison and his hard-working team of inventors who paved the way for so much of the entertainment that we enjoy today.